Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Miranda Ayim podcast. I'm Miranda Ayim, a two-time Olympian with Team Canada, and today I'm joined by Susan Cockle. Susan is a registered psychologist and mental performance consultant with the Canadian Sports Psychology Association. She's also a service provider for the Canadian Centre of Mental Health in Sport. She is also the mental health lead for the Tokyo 2021 Paralympic Games, a vital role at any time, but especially now with the postponement of the Games and the current pandemic. She has been working in mental performance since 2008 and is a provider in both the fields of mental performance and mental health. In this episode of the Miranda Ayim podcast, Susan and I discuss what holistic mental performance looks like, how to tap into the flow state, and why sports feel so dang empowering, especially for women in marginalized communities. If you want to perform better while prioritizing your mental health, this conversation is for you. If you enjoy today's discussion and draw some value from it, please consider taking a moment to like, comment, subscribe. If you have a friend that you think would benefit from this discussion as well, go ahead and share the link with them because what's better than sharing some knowledge with a little bit of love sprinkled in. For more content like this, you can visit mirandaayim.com. And thank you again just for investing your time with me here today. Now, let's get into the conversation. Well, thank you for joining me today, Susan. Miranda, it is so lovely to see you, and it's my absolute pleasure. Really happy to be here. I know. It's been so long since we last chatted in person, so I'm happy we at least get this virtual connection that we're able to do uh, uh, during this time. Um, I'm wondering if you could kind of take us through, for the people who don't know you, kind of a, a, give us a bit of a background of who you are, uh, where you're from, and how you came to be where you are today. For sure. Well, um, you and I have known each other since 2013. Sounds about right. Yes, 2013. So I'm a registered psychologist. I'm a mental performance consultant with the Canadian Sports Psychology Association. I'm a service provider for the Canadian Centre for Mental Health and Sport, which is a new organization that's national across the country to make sure that our athletes, coaches and staff get support that they need. I am the lead for Tokyo Paralympics uh, in mental health. And I've been working in high performance sports since 2008. I've prepared athletes and teams for five Olympic games. Yeah, and um, I just love to work in that space of person-centered and performance-driven. Mm -hmm. So how do we support the person and the individual to be able to perform at their, at their best, at their ultimate, without suffering cost to mental health? That's such a delicate balance. And I think that's what has stood out to me about you specifically from the moment I met you, met you and uh, you started working with the, the national team. Uh, in the world of mental performance, there's a lot of focus on performing, obviously, <laughs> reaching those goals, um, those objectives, whether they're stats or performance objectives, um, medals, placements. Um, and you've always taken the, the approach of this holistic um, tapping into the person, like you mentioned, uh, making sure that the whole being is supported so that we're becoming our best self, so to speak. And I, I really have appreciated that about you and why I'm so certain that anybody who's listening will take a lot of value from this conversation. I really appreciate you saying that. And, you know, I think when we focus on performance, which is necessary in high performance when I mean, it's in the name, um, um, we often just get stuck in the head. And then we don't access all of those other human capabilities, kind of the X factor 
which is are the heart and the gut. So by looking at the whole person, I think we can also tap into some of those other factors that can aid performance, but ha also has the benefit of aiding the person, not just for the sport, but for life. When we tap into heart and go deeper and even just right into the gut and what might be holding you back and what are all of those stories that you bring to the table when you are in a high performance place so that you don't compartmentalize to the point where it becomes damaging. We all need to be able to compartmentalize to do our job, but if we compartmentalize to the point where it's like split off, we call it dissociation in the psychology world. Um, that's not healthy. So it's like, where do we find that sweet spot? Exactly, that's, that's my question because a lot of sports and life in general is is played off of um playing off of that emotion especially when you're in those like high intensity sports um but sometimes it's to the detriment of your focus or vice versa you're hyper focused and you're you're missing out on the joy of the the game mm -hmm. um or if you're too focused on the exact game plan, you might be missing out on the intuitive flow of what's actually happening in the moment. So break that down for us, as since you're the expert, how do you help people kind of balance that and recognize when they should be doing what? You know, it's funny you say that. Um, I was brushing my teeth in anticipation of starting my day this morning. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> yeah, great. Great start to the day. <laughs> High performance habits. <laughs> um, and this idea came to me because uh, one of the things we know is that our brain has already set up that capability for us to be able to have the high performance playbook, the technical and the tactical aspect of things right in the front of our brain is the prefrontal cortex. It's our working memory. It's where we learn, it's where we store information. It's what we rely on, especially in a sport like basketball. There's a lot of technical, tactical playbook types of, of pieces that go into a world-class performance. So we have to stay in connection to the playbook. But you're right, that passion, that motivation, that joy, that flow, that love actually is in another part of the brain. It's in the emotional part of the brain. It's in the limbic system, which is, is in the middle, like it's deep, deep, deep down in the middle of the brain. Mm -hmm. Now, if we go full on into limbic system, we actually deactivate this part of the brain, the playbook. So it goes offline. So you, you can imagine, you know, neural circuits all lit up like a Google map showing you lights on at night or something. <laughs> and, uh, you know, these lights start to dim and go down. And then if something critical happens, an intense game, everything's on the line, Olympic games, qualifiers, world champs, and then something happens like a player goes down or, the scoreboard is not reflecting the effort that's going in. And then we can go way back into brainstem. And that is fight, flight, freeze. Then you are not able to connect to your playbook at all. And you've gone into that very primitive survival mechanism. So my idea today when I was brushing my teeth <laughs> was because what we want to do is make sure that athletes have that level of awareness and coaches and staff have that level of awareness. Huh, what part of my brain am I operating out of right now? And we want to have one foot in the playbook and one foot in the limbic system. And if we go into our brainstem or survival brain, we want to be able to recognize it, come back out and reconnect. So here was the idea. On the floor, create those three areas, we call it the triune brain, three areas of the brain, and um, have teams start to recognize literally where they're in by throwing out cues and then asking them to stand in different spots of the brain on the floor. 
and then something happens, what are you going to do to bring it back? So it becomes tangible. And it's, it's something that it's not just spoken about, because then you're only accessing that part of the brain, it's something that needs to be felt. Mm. And something that needs to go and be internalized into the gut too with practice. That makes sense, especially for athletes, because most of what we do, we live in our bodies. It's literally how we make our living and it's yes. how we express ourselves. Um, so it, it makes sense to have a tactic like, like that to be able to connect to those two parts of the brain or the three parts of the brain rather. Um, and I know I've used some tactics or strategies such as like breathing, um, techniques to kind of even just give you the pause to ask yourself the question, because we don't often have the, the space to think and form full thoughts in the in a, a game or a practice or whatever whatever it is to be able to to bring in that uh prefrontal cortex of like hey where am i what's going on where should i be rather than just being lost in like panic what's going on i need to uh <laughs> i need to do something i need to react uh, i'm horrible or whatever else crazy stuff that goes through our our mind um <laughs> So I'm going to ask you, because this is the beauty. We, I, when you invited me to do this, I said, yeah, I'd love to do this, but can I ask you some questions too? And you said, yeah, yeah, let's make it a conversation. So, mm -hmm. so when you do that breathing practice, how do you do it? And when do you do it? I mean, there's natural pauses throughout the game. Um, and it's not just timeouts or, or halftime. It's when the ball goes out of bounds or something like that. Or you're on the bench. That's a bit easier of a time. And usually you're caught up in watching the game. But sometimes that can be a check in point as well. Like other than just being a passive observer of what's going on externally, rather becoming an observer of what's going on internally. So taking those moments. And I'm not sure that I actually... Um, tell myself okay intake one two three and ex and, and exhale you know i've done that in various parts of my career but now it's kind of just like i it's it's more of a reaction of of something's going on so i'm a lot more aware of it so i can tap in and assess oh i am in my emotions right now because um some action just happened that happened is similar to something that happened five years ago. So I'm reacting like how I was just like kind of going down this, this rabbit hole and then um, responding to that question with um, some responses in like, am I the same person as I was then? Do I have more skills to cope with that situation? Do I have uh, the same identity? Because just kind of those confidence pieces I, I think for me and a lot of other athletes, when we're struggling the most is when our confidence is down and we're doubting ourselves. So bringing that kind of evidence back into play um, has always been helpful for me. I love that. And, and I love how for you, because hello, two-time Olympian, and with if all things go according to plan, um, three-time Olympian, um, which is remarkable, remarkable Mer. Right. And, and so just allowing to pause on that and savor that remarkable mm -hmm. and, you know, what your experience and practice and self-discovery has taught you is how to do that intuitively. You don't need to the, do the breathe one, two, three and exhale. Right. Um, and, and we do at the beginning is training. I mean, that's why we call it practice, active practice. But the fact that you've internalized it and know the points at which is going to be most beneficial for you to do that allows you to be more in a flow state and allows you to do it from your heart and from your gut as well as from from your brain and um, to, to kind of link it back to what's going on in your brain here's the beauty of great breathing and breathing technique it's actually regulated by brain stem it is your survival we when we think brainstem, the brainstem is all what is online when a baby is born. What is the first thing the baby does? <gasps> and cries, right? So that is our most primitive way of resetting ourselves back into our emotion and then back into our playbook, into our rational brain. And then when you're back into the irrational brain, yes, you're able to say to yourself, ah, 
This is not five years ago. This is now. This is now. And, and all of those learnings, all of those pieces of awareness and connection and enhanced playbook have happened in five years. It's a long time in an athletic career. Sometimes in some sports, that's the whole athletic career, right? And, and at a high performance space. Yeah. Um, so to be, I think that's a brilliant example of how you are then able to bring it into confidence and belief and self because I think that's the deeper layer isn't it it's, it's confidence yes asking those questions like what have I done what have I learned what is my identity now what is my role now uh, where am I at now and then tying those thoughts to belief into the heart and into the gut mm -hmm. yeah I love how you connected it to a flow state as well I have mm -hmm. this um affinity for habit making because I think mm. as soon as we can make something a habit and not not so conscious um, mm. it's so so much easier to to reach for automatically especially in mm. in high pressure situations and mm. um, that becomes your identity is just instead of something that you do it is something that you are and mm. that's something that I practice in my my life um, trying to be a better person and building habits to support that. And then obviously in my career as well, building high performance habits um, that that support where I want to go as well, because uh, in fast paced games uh, environments, there's there's no time to break down exactly what's going on. But if we have a habit perhaps of breathing or um, some sort of reflective process or a, a, a physical check-in. I know different people do maybe like clenching, releasing, and then that kind of gets that kind of stress out of your body, whatever it is, as soon as that becomes a habit, you, you break down the steps of one, two, three, four, five, then it just becomes like one, do, and then you can go back into the game, you know, and then you stay in that, that flow state. I love that because it's like one do, and I would add one do be. Mm. So that actually becomes a part of being, not just doing. Yes. And then we know that it's truly internalized and incorporated into the self and into the actions and into the behaviors that are necessary in that moment. But it really is coming from a sense of, regulation, self-regulation and awareness and being that is hard to quantify really. That's the tough part because we talk about these things, especially, you know, like you and I were, we're super into this topic area and maybe we try to explain it to someone else. And um, you could be met with the response of like, well, so what does it change? Or like, how do you quant like, has this improved your results? Maybe, maybe it has, but over like a five year, 10 year span, it's kind of hard to point to what exactly one of those strategies um, played out in your career. Um, so it is, it's in that like weird space of, I know this works, so I'm going to commit to it. But I know that the, the field of mental performance and psychology in general has like just blossomed over the past 10 years uh, or longer, of course. I wonder if you could speak a little bit to that, because I know you started off in the psych world. And then I remember reading somewhere, I think it was at the beginning of your practice, you were working with um, some indigenous communities in northern Alberta and you realize that people weren't really coming out, but they would if you played volleyball with them. And that's mm -hmm. when you kind of made that connection between sport and uh, psychology and, and how you interwove that into your career. So I wonder if you could uh, speak a little bit to, to that. Oh, I didn't know you were gonna ask me that. I didn't even know you knew that. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to. It was to. a great thing. That's awesome. You know, I'm going to take it back a little bit if we're, if we're going to enter into the realm of story. Um, I grew up in Scotland and played lots of sport in Scotland. But one of the things that I wasn't allowed to do was play basketball. And the reason I wasn't allowed to play basketball was because I'm female. Interesting. 
And Mer, you know me, people can't tell when I'm sitting, but I'm five foot 10. Um, I have a, a very large wingspan and I played field hockey. So I like contact sport. Yeah. And I was not allowed to play basketball because I'm female. Mm -hmm. I remember one day at gym. So I got to play netball instead. Okay. So girls played netball, boys played basketball. I remember one day at gym on the playing fields playing hockey and we were watching the boys play rugby. I didn't know anything about equality or <laughs> equal rights or feminism back then. Um, this was small town working class Scotland. And I went up to the PE teacher and I said, how come we don't get to play rugby? And I said, I think it's important. Can, why can't we play rugby? And the female PE teacher said, hmm, good question. Next week, I'm gonna to talk to the head who's a male and see what can happen next. Mm -hmm. So next week we got on the playing field and they said, you can play rugby. Just for one day, you can play rugby. And so the girls went out and we, we didn't know how to play rugby. We didn't know the rules. We'd seen it on TV, but you know, you, can't, you throw the ball backwards, you catch the ball, you run, you take down some people, okay? So the captain was running with the ball and I was a track athlete, a sprinter, so I could move. And so I ran him down and I grabbed him by the waist and I took him down and I got the ball. And in that moment, that feeling of empowerment, of accomplishment, of having done something outside of myself, because I was a fairly shy kid, having done something outside of myself resonated with me. And as I'm, I haven't actually told the story. So as I'm telling it now, I'm thinking, yeah, I can feel this. It's like, yeah, power. Yeah. <laughs> so when I fast forward into uh, working in First Nations communities I would fly in, and uh, I would be invited to work with children and youth. And we created a summer program uh, with one of the, the First Nations health workers from the community. And, and he and I would be ready to go at nine, 10 o'clock in the morning and no one would show up. <laughs> and we thought, hmm, I wonder why no one's showing up. Okay, everyone's still sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> but we had access to a gym. Now I was allowed to play volleyball. So I knew how to play volleyball and I had a gym and I had a volleyball net. The reason I told that I wasn't allowed to play basketball story was because I think if I had played basketball, I probably would have gotten more uptake oh. in the gym. <laughs> Fair enough. But, right? but the youth started to show up to play volleyball. I knew nothing about sports psychology. It, it just was not on my radar. Obviously, it was a field, but it, I had not been introduced to it at all back then. But I saw that sport ignited a sense of empowerment within people, the mm -hmm. same feeling that I had had when I said, but wait a minute, can I play rugby? And with that, that marrying of sport and then counseling practice, because once we played volleyball, we would sit in a circle and we would just check in. How are you doing? What's going on? Ah, and then I would drip in or infuse counseling strategy, empathy, connection, support, resources, internal and external resources, so that we could create something a little bit meaningful. One day I was very honored before we played volleyball, the youth worker and two other leaders in the community um, invited me to a, a smudging ceremony, a sweet grass ceremony. And we sat on the stage in the gym and they brought out the, the bowl of sweet grass. And then we did a smudging ritual. And I, of course, you know, small town Scotland, how did I get here? I don't know what I'm doing, but I just said, Susan, just follow. Just, and, and maybe I should have asked, um, can you explain a little bit more to me? So I had a playbook, but I just went with the emotional part of the brain and honoring and feeling um, very humble to be in that space and to be invited in. And so 
those, those pieces taught me that when we enter in through sport, there's a common language. When we infuse conversations of safety and allow a safe space for people to speak their truth. And then when we have a mutual sharing that goes beyond the tangible, the measurables, the how is this working, that, that really speaks more to the spiritual, mm -hmm. that, that something beautiful can happen. That's exactly the word that I was thinking. Beautiful, beautiful. Mm. I think to, yeah please no go yeah. ahead go ahead finish what finish your thought well the, the thought was then just to bridge it to the field and you know what what I've seen happen and the, and because I I want to be compliant and answer your question <laughs> you can do whatever you more than answer you give us a whole beautiful background and mm. instances and uh, while you were speaking I completely re related to to all the different pieces. A, the empowering feeling that comes along with sport. I think about this mostly when I'm lifting weights and of course on, on, the, on the court as well, when you are again in that flow state and everything is feeling so smooth and you know, all those pieces are coming together, but something as simple as lifting weights, like I can lift up things you know, a practical skill, like I can do it myself. It's so simple, you know? And it's so simple, but doesn't that speak to confidence, empowerment? It, it, it allows you to have that evidence that you spoke about earlier. Mm -hmm. When things go a bit sideways to go, ah, 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 but look what I can do. Exactly. Look what is in within my capability. It's massive. Yeah. yeah. And then the, the whole team, because I come from a, a team sport, which brings in your strength, I can do this, but also I don't need to do it all alone. We can do it together and I can rely on the skills and strengths of those around me, especially if I'm not having a good day or this isn't my specific strength. Um, I can lean on those around me. And like you said, um, just the act of physically moving and connecting with people breaks down barriers of, of people from all sorts of different backgrounds, whatever is going on in, in individual lives. Um, it's like the ultimate icebreaker. As soon as you, you kind of get moving around people and, and, and connect uh, towards a common goal, it, it makes sense that it was the, the perfect um, I guess, segue into an opportunity for you to connect uh, with those individuals who came out to your, your volleyball sessions, even though you wish that they were basketball sessions. <laughs> not that I'm dissing volleyball. Not at <laughs> all, I, not at all. I really did like the feeling that volleyball gave me. When you can smack that ball, yeah, there's, uh, there's some real power in that. <laughs> oh, I'm 100% a volleyball fan. Yeah, Mara, and look what's happening right now, just to echo your point. You and I have not spoken in, in years like this, right? In years. Mm -hmm. And look at the safety and the connection of this conversation because it's about safety within relationship and that moving that we would have done together. And that, um, you know, on, you know, LRT trains and, you know, in gyms and, at uh, dinner tables and and then the other piece around honoring story and creating safety and then um and then that connection allows for growth and and that relationship is is true even if it if it doesn't need to be fed in the interim and i think that's what that's ultimately what we want to be able to do in our profession is to be able to, through relationship, connect people to their, their, the beauty of themselves. I mean, I use the word beautiful, right? Like the, the beauty of themselves from an empowered perspective, from a confident perspective, from a belief perspective, so that they can do it on their own, so that they can do it on their own. And, and they, could, they could do it on their own even before this, um, service or, or this um, connection was in place. 
but it's I, our field as mental performance consultants is to enhance what people already have. And I think that's where the growth in our field has come in the last decade, especially. You know, before it was very um, more maybe skill oriented, right? You know, these are the skill sets that, that we're going to teach. And that is very important. We still want to have skill sets. But then we, we also know that creating opportunity for relationship, leaning into the science, doing neurobiofeedback. Um, really leaning into things like mindfulness training, which really is a spiritual practice that allows you then to operate on the court as a whole holistic being. Mm -hmm. You know, we didn't talk on those terms before in the field. So it's been exciting. It's the reason why I wanted to, to transition um, in 2006 into to sport. Uh, and sport performance, because I could see the value for human beings. Mm -hmm. and, if, and I thought, if I can do this work, maybe I can prevent some people from having to do the real mental health slash mental illness kind of piece. Mm -hmm. Kind as of as a, a preventative um, yes. piece. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I, mm -hmm. I think a lot of people are, are reaching out um, to that mm -hmm. one because uh, mental health has has come on the scene and has uh, gotten much more clarity around it and understanding mm -hmm. and people are a lot more welcoming but then also that proactive nature of uh, I don't need to just survive what can I do to thrive yes. and uh, bring that that best self out, out of me uh, whether mm -hmm. it be by myself or with um, people who, who help me, who, who would be people like you, uh, mm -hmm. mental performance coaches or whatever role uh, that person might be in. Um, I'm wondering, for people who are just starting along this journey and who are in a space where they're like, okay, I'm preparing for a new role or I just kind of want to up my game a little bit, what's some of the first steps that you you take them into to kind of get into that self-reflection, self-awareness space and implementing whatever kind of shifts that they might need to do. Mm -hmm. I have three things that I want people to be able to do when we're just starting out with this. And uh, I break it down and make it very simple because when we're under pressure, we need things to be simple and accessible really quickly. And the three things are head, heart, feet, head, heart, feet. So head, we have to be conscious and aware of our inner dialogue. What are our inner thoughts? What is our self-talk saying about ourselves? Where are our red flags in terms of our stories that we might be perpetuating of not good enough or doom and gloom or disaster? And let's flip that switch so that we can start to train our thinking in our head so that it can be more proactive. So that starts, it all starts with awareness. So we shine a light on the train of thought inside your head. What's going on inside your head? So then you start to look at, ah, okay, look in this situation, this is what I do. I start to think this. If we don't change our train of thought, you could be doing other techniques over and over and over again. Your breathing practice isn't gonna be that great if you're hooked into the I'm not good enough story inside your head. Yeah. So we definitely wanna be managing our thinking. Head, heart goes to heart rate. You know, we're, we're now reconnecting to the emotional part of the brain as well as within the body. And then there's your breathing technique. I would have people practice breathing. And there's some great apps to do that. Um, coherence, heart rate plus, um, heart math. Those are, the, those are the ongoing practices that we want people to be doing because it, it changes your brain. This is what's so exciting. This is where our field has changed. We didn't know this. We thought the brain was static. We thought the brain was like the hard drive in a computer, but no, it's plastic and we can change it. And the more we practice breathing, the more we actually not just make it more efficient to breathe and to, to become regulated, but we actually change the physical structure of the brain. Like that blows me away. 
we change the size, the function, the, the functionality, the speed at which we can regulate. Hmm. There's more white myelin sheath around the neural network. Incredible. Right? It's amazing. So breathing technique, clear. We want to be doing that. Head, heart, and then feet. Let's build some strategies to ground the body in time and space right here, right now. And it may be as simple as, as doing this technique that we could do right now. And that is just pushing your feet into the floor. Hmm. Now, I know your feet can touch the floor. I always have to check to make sure that some people <laughs> can touch the floor. And, and then we just notice what happens in the body when we do that. You know, we scrunch our feet. We can do some bilateral stimulation. We know that that shifts brainwave pattern and it helps us get into that relaxed focus part of the brain those alpha waves that are great for performance mm -hmm. uh, and then as we're doing that pushing into the floor then we notice our hamstrings being held in the chair as we sit here right now and then our spine up the back of the chair that whole idea of having your own back or your team having your back when we can actually ground ourselves through our back and just notice our spine in time and space that helps us regulate. So those are the, the touch points that I want people when they're beginning this journey to be able to do. Manage thinking, do their breathing, ground their body. That's, and it's so easy to, to recall the head, heart and uh, feet because rooted in that body and then you get that deeper, um, uh, deeper sense of what's going on when you were talking about the mind, I, I, I have this thing that sometimes I do when I'm, th I'm lost in thought, I realize that I'm lost in thought. And I try to follow that thread back to where, wh where did this come from? How did I get here? You know, and sometimes I'm able to do it if I haven't been lost in thought very long. But like, if I was just spaced out, I, um, <laughs> I won't be able to, to do it after like, five or six little thought changes. Uh, you're right in the, the warren. You're not just in the rabbit hole, you're in the rabbit warren with all, all of the branches. Oh, 100%, 100%. That awareness piece has, has been incredible for me when I started this journey into kind of mm, discovering a little bit more about mental performance and just in general, what's going on in, in here, you know? Um, and- oh, Can I ask? What's the game? What's been the game? What have been the game changers for you when it comes to mental performance and and practice? What have you done that's made a difference? Um, well, this all started. I guess we'll we'll do my own. Um, bring it back to, to to several years ago, and I've talked about this before in in various uh, contexts. But um, when I was playing professionally in um, Turkey, in Istanbul, Turkey. And I, I had a, a serious back injury. I had a, two bulging discs that I didn't realize were bulging. I just realized I was in pain all the time. I couldn't stand, sit, lie down without pain. Um, but you know, as athletes, we kind of just push through and you're like, well, this is normal. I'm always in some sort of pain. This is just an elevated, excruciating kind of pain. Um, and I got to a point where I, I wasn't operating in a good, very good space, physically, mentally, emotionally. Um, my body was obviously protect, trying to protect itself because I was continuing to practice. I, I never stopped. Uh, I was never diagnosed. Um, and mentally, because I was in pain, um, I was in this anxious state of mind where I, I couldn't do my job. Like I literally couldn't catch a ball with overthink without overthinking it. Um, and throughout all of this, I wasn't at a stage where I had enough self-awareness to, to know what was going on, on like a meta level. Um, obviously physically, I didn't know what was going on with my body. Um, emotionally, I, knew that I wasn't playing well, but I thought it was because I was a bad player. I didn't connect uh, what was going on on the court with that, that injury. And then, um, yeah, just 
just going down into this spiral of shame and uh, lack of self-confidence and stress. And, you know, it, it was a process over many years to, to get out of that. Um, I definitely tried some coping mechanisms, some were better than others, um, assuredly. And um, finally got to a place where I realized, wow, what a power our mind holds over our body and vice versa as well. Mm -hmm. It's just a, a, a cycle, a self-feeding cycle, if you will, of um, give and take. And, and that's when I, I started exploring how can I get in touch with what's going on and how can I change some of those trains of thoughts like you uh, touched on earlier, um, because my train of thought is not leading me to where I need to be. If I want to continue to play and get on the court, I can't, I can't play the way that I, I am and I can't play with this train of thought. Um, so I couldn't tell you what my first step would be if I had reached out to someone or if I read something specifically that changed, I just know over a period of time, trying different things, working on different things, talking to different people, you came into my life probably shortly after that time, actually. Um, and, and being in this high performance context. And then you also have some of those experiences where you're able to get to a point where you've pushed through and you, you have like little baby evidences, you know, like a little glimpse of, of that past, like, oh, maybe I can do this. And that's why I touched on, you know, kind of calling on and questioning, questioning those cat catastrophizing thoughts and questioning this, um, these, this thinking that is, is quite detrimental. Um, so a, a positive, graceful approach to what's going on in my own mind ha has helped me tremendously in opening up a whole new world of high performance, which doesn't seem like it fits quite in a world that's like so aggressive and contact and high paced, you know, but like extending grace to yourself and others, I, I have found has been a game changer. Wow. Mer, just seeing you say this, and I can, you know, feel it across the screen, uh, you know, across continents, um, you know, beauty and grace. I mean, who, who knew that, that this is kind of where the, this conversation would land? And of course, those are the unmeasurables, yeah. beauty and grace, right? Yeah. Um, and as you're talking, I can almost see um, this, this image of, you know, that negative train of thought that you highlighted there. And then you mentioned the word shame. And then we tend to carry shame in our, in our gut, in our being, right? Like mm -hmm. deep in there. And it, it's almost like scar tissue starts to form between the train of thought and the shame. Back and forth, back and forth, laid down, laid down, so scar tissue. And then what breaks it up? You, you just say grace for yourself, grace, you know, showing grace to self, grace to others, compassion, caring, love. Yeah. Which then can fit in with our why. Exactly. Oh, that's so true, actually. And that I think has been the, the biggest game changer. I said grace was a game changer, it was, but connecting um, to a deeper purpose which is um, why I really love playing for the national team because it is something that's so much bigger than myself. Um, I play overseas for a check, essentially. This is my job. Um, it's a great game and it's, I, I enjoy what I do. And I've been in the place where I am currently for the past six years um, because I found a place that's just like a second home. Um, but, at the same time, playing for your, your nation, your, your national team at a different level where, you know, it, it's, it's not about what you're getting paid because we're, we're not really getting paid. Um, it's really giving what you can to uh, a team, a, a, you know, it's, it's something outside of your, yourself. And then as I've gotten older and become more experienced and become a leader on the team, it's, it's shifted away from my own personal performance, um, which I still want to keep at a, a high level, a very consistent level. Um, but 
it's shifted away from that as far as importance into what is my purpose now? And my purpose now is to lead the people who are coming up the next generation, to lead my current team to become the best that we can be. And, and to also enjoy the process because like you mentioned earlier, sporting careers are so short. Mine is coming to an end. Everyone's will come to an end. And um, just enjoying the moment, enjoying being able to, to live and move so free, freely. And, um, and that has made everything else pale in comparison, has made, allowed me to let go of a lot of that shame and perfectionism and uh, criticism that I've held. And I think a lot of athletes and high-performing people, whatever context they're in, hold when they're really ambitious and going after something. That has allowed me to let go of that because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter, you know, what other people are thinking about me or, or what I'm worried about, you know, as long as I'm fulfilling my purpose, it's all good. Beautiful. And, and when you're fulfilling your purpose, you know your worth, you know your value, you, you know what you are able to, to give and contribute, not, not just even in a sport context, but outside of that. Mm -hmm. which is massive it's so true you know when you, when I hear you and and see you speak about the higher purpose and and playing for the national team you know some some other um organizations some other sport organizations other teams that I work with I often refer to Canadian women ba women's basketball is like bleeding the flag like bleeding Canada and it's hard to express that um, to other teams that you maybe see don't do that. Can, can you explain that? Can you put to words a little bit about what that's like for you? Yeah, I'm, we definitely have that, that imagery going on. And it's something that, I mean, the women who have become, who have come before me in the program have definitely laid the groundwork for, I was um, lucky enough to come into a in an organization that while it wasn't highly ranked, they had a strong culture of dedication, loyalty, grit, Canadian values um, that we've held on to with all of our might over the years. Um, and when I came in, like I said, we weren't ranked very high. And throughout my career, I've been able to witness the progression of now being fourth in the world and, and seeing how the dynamics change, but that, that hasn't really, you know? And to your question, I'm not, I'm not sure exactly what or how that, that came to be, um, but I am exceedingly thankful for it. I know um, the coaches over the years have been very mindful about the individuals that they bring into the, the program because a team is a lot more than just the best person, you know? It's about the a high level of excellence, yes, but also how you fit into the system, what you're willing to give to the system, to the team. Um, and that's what, what makes it so, so interesting, this process of building a team. It's not just putting together the best people. I remember reading in a book recently, what book was it? Um, I know I have it on one of my shelves over here. Um, I thought, oh, it was The Culture Code, I believe, by Daniel Coyle. Do you have it with you? I see you moving around. Oh, that's too funny. <laughs> what? It's, oh my goodness. Oh, hilarious. Um, so I believe it's this book, correct me if I'm wrong, but he mentions, uh, I believe at the beginning, um, forming groups of different cross sections. And there was like um, the high, highly qualified engineers or whatever, and uh, maybe another group of business people and then a group of kindergartners, 
And they're all given this task of creating a structure from, I believe it's spaghetti noodles and like a marshmallow and you have a band maybe as well. It's a, a typical team building exercise and you're given a set amount of time and there's not really any rules. You just need to like make it the highest that you can. Um, it's more difficult than it seems. I've done it a few times. <laughs> But if one was to wager who is going to win the task, you would say like probably the engineers, they have the, the know-how to do it. But it ends up being the kindergartners <laughs> just because they're able to work the best together. And by their own weird kid logic, they like, you know, they combine their skills to create the highest structure. Well, like the adults are have something like here, it maybe looks more beautiful, but it's not the highest. That's not what the, the instructions were or the, the, the goal was. Uh, and that just blows my mind and, and speaks to the idea that it's, it's not the best or the highest qualified person. It's just like people who are able to just work together and, and get, get the job done. Yeah, it's the old, you know, the whole is worth more than the sum of the parts, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Is that there's something extra that happens when all of those parts start to come together and work together. It, it also is a great example to reinforce what we spoke about earlier, because kindergartners don't have a fully formed prefrontal cortex. In fact, we don't get that until we're 25. So they have a very, very limited playbook. But what they do have is emotional connectivity. They know how to get along with, with peers. In kindergarten, everyone just gets along. There's no little kind of cliques in kindergarten, right? Everyone just kind of plays together. I'll play with you today and you tomorrow. And we, they don't um, judge, prejudge other people. Beautiful. So then those are actually qualities we look for in teams. And, and as you say, you know, you've been blessed with, and I'll, you didn't use that word, but I'm kind of infusing it, you know, like um, it. systems and, and coaches where they have looked beyond what the individual skill sets may be and how can we create something bigger, something more, and something that's rooted in, in Canada and Canadian values and what we stand for as, as humans. Mm -hmm. Huge. Mm -hmm. Powerful. So huge. Yeah, I love it. Mm. And I, I think the, the longer I am away from Canada, and I've been living away from Canada now 15 years, I believe, um, the more Canadian I become, <laughs> as illogical that, as that sounds, I just realize how blessed I am to be Canadian, um, mm. how, what a wonderful country it is. Sure, every, every country has its flaws, its shortcomings, like every person has its flaws and shortcomings, but I've been, um, been able to travel so many different places in the world and live so, diff so many different places in the world. And, and I've seen a, a good share of less than ideal situations. And um, sometimes I think we don't realize how fortunate we are. And that's something as well that I, I hold very highly mm -hmm. in my my life as well just a gratitude uh to to be able to be where i am and do what i do and and to come from where i come from since we're talking about canada woohoo it makes you uh proud right like there's a level of of, of positive pride like, um mm -hmm. and and that's based in gratitude and thanks yeah yeah and, and that's one of the things that we're realizing too is part of high performance is allowing people to be able to lean into gratitude and create gratitude practice because mm. then that links to joy and when you are more joyful then that allows you to sustain the difficulties the pressure the load the psychological load as well as the physical load mm -hmm. and when we practice being mindfully in the moment and being grateful for the, the moments that we have that is, that's, that's life changing and performance changing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So while we're on the topic of uh, Canada, you are the mental health lead for the 2021 now Paralympic Games. Um, and 
always an important role, obviously, but now more than ever uh, with the delay or postponement postponement of the the games and and all that goes into dealing with moving through a pandemic just in general and also moving through the pandemic as an athlete who's who's trying to to train and i i'm kind of wondering how are you guys preparing <laughs> throughout this situation <laughs> how are you doing what you're doing and and what's on the horizon or what are you looking forward to as well do you know, um, out of um, difficulty comes opportunity. And one of the major pieces of opportunity that we've experienced over this past year is a galvanizing and a coming together of our mental performance community. So as mental performance consultants, we come together monthly, we plan and we strategize, we upskill ourselves to be able to manage uncertainty. So there's lots of pieces that are moving behind the scenes to ensure that the CPC or the Canadian Paralympic Committee and the COC, the Canadian Olympic Committee are honoring and providing space for mental health, mental health awareness, mental health check-ins and making sure that when these games go off that the mental health of our athletes, staff, and coaches are protected as best way we can. So to do that, we want to make sure that yes, we are, you know, there's an actual playbook about going into Tokyo that I'm sure you've seen um, as well. Uh, we want to make sure that we can flesh out those questions and those details as best as we can, because when we have more certainty around things, it allows us to let go of our stress and, and our anxiety. And on the other side to realizing that there will be un more unknowns than usual. And how do we tolerate having that discomfort around those unknowns? And then plugging into what we do know, plugging into our support people, making sure that we have a plan, a contingency plan in place for X, Y, and Z to happen. Um, and if it doesn't, that's great. But if it does, uh, we are ready and that we are prepared. But one of the things I did a, a presentation on this recently is, is to make sure that we're contingency planning and not worry planning. And I think that's true for athletes as well. You know, we want, we want to be staying in the side of if this, then that, and I'll deal with it. And not what if this, what if that, what if the next thing, because that impacts mental health, that explodes anxiety and um, leads to all sorts of conditions or, or stressors that does not help us from our mental health perspective. So we're doing lots of planning for any kind of contingency. We're galvanizing our people to make sure that they're ready to go. And we are being hopeful. I did a mentee poll uh, recently. Um, and one of the words that came out with, with um, staff and technical leaders was hope. We are feeling hopeful despite this chaos. Yes, we're fatigued. Yes, there's a lot of exhaustion. Yes, there's a lot of uncertainty. Yes, there's questionable motivations across the system. All of that is normal and expected, given what we've gone through for pretty much exactly a full year. So we're accepting those realities, but also dripping in and infusing hope. So I'm, I'm excited and looking forward to, to what's coming because it's, it's going to be remarkable. It's going to be difficult. Let's not, you know, blow smoke around it. It's going to be difficult. There's going to be a lot, a lot of restrictions. This is going to be an, an Olympics unlike anything you've seen in terms of, you know, connection and um, being able to, yeah, connect with other people, with other countries, to celebrate, to do all of those things that are that are um, unique to, to being part of uh, an Olympics. Um, but by the same token, these Olympics and Paralympics are going to go down in history. And to have been a part of that in your lifetime is actually remarkable. So that's how I'm looking at it, the big picture view. I like that. I like that that perspective. It's it's very beautiful and beautiful that people are coming at it in a hopeful sense as well, because mm -hmm. I think we could all use more of that for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So 
I, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I do want to ask you um, what, where rather can people follow you? Um, where can they follow your work? Are there any resources that you want to direct people to or any passion projects coming up? Let us know. Oh, well, thank you. So easy to follow me on Twitter. You'll just be able to search up my name, Susan Cockle, C-O-C-K-L-E. But um, my handle is at C4 underscore success. So that's Twitter at C4 underscore success. And um, I will be more uh, diligent in posting and checking in with people <laughs> as we get closer to this summer and uh, doing more and more work um, with our mental performance consultants across the country as well. And by the way, I was speaking to Bryce Tully this morning awesome. and he said, please make sure who is your mental performance consultant. Mm -hmm. And he said, make sure you say hi to Mer for me. So that's a big, huge huge hello um, from Bryce as well. Great. You did your job. You passed it on. Oftentimes when that comes along, I'm always like, after the conversation is done, I'm like, right? shoot, I forgot to tell them. I forgot to pass it <laughs> You did it. You did it. One last thing I want to uh, bring people's attention to, because I know you're a part of the Women in Basketball Month that Canada Basketball oh, yes. is putting oh, on. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Good job. <laughs> An assist, it's all an assist for you. So is it March 18th or the 24th? It's March 20th. 20th. Which is the Saturday. Okay. And I'm excited. I'm talking about a winning mindset. But you know from this conversation that my idea of a winning mindset is much deeper than the whole idea of winning. So we're especially going to be talking about resilience, about passion, about emotional depth and regulation and um, all things human in one hour that go into that mindset that's required for performance. So I'm excited about that. Yeah, that, so good to check that out. Where can I check that out, Mur? Because that's right on kind of basketball site. Yes, it will be on their site. I'll be sure to add a link in the description below wherever they are accessing this uh, video or podcast. And um, yeah, I that sounds fantastic. I will definitely be listening in, maybe not during the actual recording, because it will probably be the middle of the night here, but I will be getting it after the fact for sure. So thank you so much for joining me today, Susan. It was incredible as I knew it would be. Oh, Miranda, thank you so much. And I just want to give you every blessing moving forward and, and lots of hope and optimism as you move forward in this year as well. All power to you. Thank you so much.